stuck the knife in the backs of those who brought him to the dance uh, in the Kitz Miller v. Dover trial. Okay. Now this is starting to get to be stronger language, right? Sticking the knife in the back, that's, that's pretty aggressive. And, and this is the thing that one finds as one uh, reads the, the literature from intelligent design. They really speak about this in terms of a culture war uh, and uh, describe it as a military, um, uh, a military fight that they're, uh, they're after. And the terms are very pugilistic and militaristic. Uh, here's something from a new website that just came up. Oops, I missed a, uh, here we go here. Uh, Judge Jones, uh, this is from a, a site, uh, again, something that William Dembski has put up. Um, this is their front page. There's a little caricature of Jones. It says, Judge Jones, he's a wacky, zany activist. He's a rogue, and he loves that old-time Darwinian religion. So, you know, here now they're, they're not as happy with him as they were before. And this is actually a site that's encouraging high school students to join up in the movement. And, and as you see in the middle, it says, join the OE Army. Uh, OE is the name of the site. Um, so, uh, really, here uh, is, is part of a, a turnaround in the view uh, following the case. Um, there's William Dempsey down to the right, Jonathan Wells, another one of the, uh, the ID guys, and uh, their new book, The Design of Life, and I'll mention that a little bit later. Okay, so uh, this is the shift from before and after. Now, even though some of this is a little amusing, uh, it's important to recognize that, that this is really serious business. And this was an article that came out a, a little while ago that talked about what had happened to Judge Jones following the case. Uh, and he revealed that he and his family had to be put under protection of federal marshals because he had received uh, death threats following the, uh, the issuing of the verdict. Uh, and the quote from Judge Jones here says, if you would have told me when I got on the bench four years ago that I would have had death threats in a case like this, as opposed to, for example, a crack cocaine case when I meet out a heavy sentence, I would have told you that you were crazy. But I did, and that's a sad statement. Okay. So this is something we really need to keep in mind. The, the folks who uh, worry about this uh, are very serious, and some, some uh, um, dangerously so. Uh, that's, uh, um, that's unfortunate. So let's look now back at what actually happened in Dover, what was the policy, and how this proceeded. Um, so Dover, Pennsylvania, a small town south of Harrisburg, uh, and creationists on the board who got a majority uh, decided to implement a policy that would introduce um, intelligent design into the science curriculum. So they wanted to update the statement. They did update the statement, um, saying that students would uh, be required to learn about supposed gaps and problems in Darwin's theory, and be told of other theories of evolution, including, but not limited to, intelligent design. So um, explicitly putting this in. Now, actually, this is an interesting hybrid policy. It was one that explicitly promoted ID, which is what the intelligent design group had been doing previously. But they had been recognizing that that wasn't working for them. So they had actually started backing away from that and recommending that you not uh, a call for this uh, by name and to talk just about uh, critical evaluation of evolution and gaps and problems. So this was actually something that combined both of them. Uh, it hadn't quite got the message that they shouldn't have mentioned ID directly uh, and it did include both. So it actually made it a very good test case for both of the strategies that the intelligent design group was making. The second thing that the policy did was uh, uh, bring in the key intelligent design textbook that was designed for um, public schools, of pandas and people. That's the cover of it there. And that was listed as um, something that would be available for students. And 60 copies of this were anonymously donated to, uh, to the library. Uh, when this happened, um, there was someone uh, who, who wound up calling me, uh, who was in, in England, but who had come from a school district in Pennsylvania, who was so, someone who was a scientist, who was so uh, angry at, at this. And, and he said, you know, would you mind uh, if I had 60 copies of your book, uh, Tower of Babel, donated to uh, the school district. And I, I actually should have said yes, in retrospect. Uh, but what I, what I said was, you know, uh, what would really make a better statement is if instead you had 60 copies donated of different books uh, to give the scientific explanation, because there's just a huge, huge range of evidence, uh, and that would really make a better statement. Um, the other thing that was in uh, this was that a disclaimer was to be read. Uh, when there was evolution taught uh, that uh, uh, students would hear. And supposedly the teachers were to, to read this. Here's the, 
uh, excerpt from the disclaimer, it says, because Darwin's theory is a theory, continues to be tested, um, the theory is not a fact. Now, this is actually language that we've seen again and again uh, from creationist initiatives, contrasting the scientific notion of theory uh, with uh, um, the way the person on the street hears it, which is theory as just someone's guess and so on. Obviously, in science, when we talk about theory, gravitational theory, cell theory, gra uh, relativity theory, and so on, we don't mean it in that sense. But they always uh, apply the term here in that colloquial sense, essentially to make people think that this is just a guess, right? The scientists are just uh, unsure about this, which of, which of course is not the case. Um, they talk about here gaps in the theory uh, for which there's no evidence. Uh, and then it goes on to, to talk about intelligent design and pandas and people available for students. Now, the teachers were supposed to read this, and one of the things that sort of made me stand up and cheer when I heard about this as the case was developing uh, was when the biology teachers as a unit uh, decided that they would uh, refuse to read the statement, uh, that it was professionally irresponsible of them, uh, that this misrepresented science. And for those of us in, in the university where academic freedom is, is really taken for granted, that might not seem such a big thing, but you really don't have that kind of academic uh, freedom in the public schools. And really they were putting their jobs at risk by doing this. Um, taking a professional stand for the integrity of science. So that, that really just, it, it, it just really made me, uh, made me very proud of, of the teachers who were on the front line of this. Okay, so now let's talk about what it is that's being proposed as the alternative. What is uh, intelligent design? So here's um, a brochure that the Discovery Institute had put out several years ago um, from their Re Center for the Renewal of Science and Culture, which was a, a subgroup within it that dealt with this particular issue, um, where they were explaining what uh, intelligent design is. Now here you see the image with uh, God, uh, the, the Sistine Chapel image, uh, reaching out to DNA. Uh, in their original logo, they actually had the full image with Adam there, but they had removed Adam and, and put in the coil of DNA. Later ones, they, they uh, took God away a little bit more to make it a little more nebulous, and their logo became, well, actually a, a nebula, <laughs> uh, God's eye nebula, uh, all to sort of progressively hide uh, the religious uh, aspect of their view. Because what they want people to think is that this is a scientific view. And if you look inside, this is the way they describe it. Design theory, they say, is a new science for a new century. And, and they appeal to a number of different things, and it's important to recognize this. It's not just about biology. Here's an example from it where they say this is true in physics, too. So they're actually um, uh, uh, um, drawing from other, uh, other sciences. It's not just an attack upon biological views, evolutionary views, but physics, uh, geology, a whole range of things wind up getting involved as well. Um, but it's biology that's the center. So here's a quote. Biology, they say, the presence of complex, functionally integrated machines, like this bacterial motor, uh, have supposedly cast doubt on Darwinian mechanisms of self-assembly, sparked new interest in the design hypothesis. So they're using scientific terminology here. Um, uh, the, the bacterial flagellum actually is kind of their poster child and appeared again and again and again in the, in the Kitzmiller trial. It almost just seemed as though their entire case was, was riding on the tail of the fl flagellum. Uh, it was brought up so many times. Um, that's really their, their, the main example that they give again and again and again. Okay. Now, the thing that you hear from them regularly is the claim, we're not creationists, right? Um, idea science. Uh, these are both quotes from Discovery Institute uh, spokespeople. Uh, ideas and creationism just aren't the same. Ideas not creationism. They'll, they'll put this in op-eds and letters to the editor. They'll say this very regularly, um, claiming that they're different. And this was one of the things that was uh, at issue in the trial because courts had previously ruled on creation science, and they wanted to say, oh, no, those rules, those court cases don't apply to us. Uh, and one of the things that, that was mentioned was the way in which intelligent design is defined and described in that book, Pandas and People. So here's a quote from uh, 